Brothers, and welcome back to the battlefield entrenched on Tartarus as Chaos and, of course, the mighty Eldar come together in order to quell the threat that lurks beneath the surface. My god, this is going to be the ending of this game. Again, these older games, short to the point. Squeeze everything in. Don't outstay their welcome. I've talked about it a bunch on our journey already, especially with Space Marine. And I appreciate it so much. It's just a good feeling. You just walk away with a good feeling. It's like, hey, that was amazing. And did you want to do more? Yes. And then they've got a bunch of expansions. So before we get into the details of the game, expansion talk, we have a bunch of games that we've listed for Warhammer Summer, but we are discovering as we play through them that there are, you know, DLCs, expansions for the ones we really like. I'm probably going to come back and do some more of Dawn of War 1. That is probably going to happen, especially because as some of you have played this game, Blue Balls. And there's a theme developing in the Warhammer gaming universe is that they know they are they're gambling on expansions don't really expect a full resolution on some massive teaser at the end of your game because they're probably setting up a sequel. They're, they they were doing what a lot of TV shows do now, way before the TV shows were doing it. Way, way before, because it happened again. What happened in the game? I'm loving the story. Let's talk about gameplay first before we get to the story. Gameplay-wise... Everything in this game, at least we're playing on normal mode because we have a lot of games to knock out, right? I don't want to end up, um, as much as I love hard modes, I have no issue with them, as you guys know, uh, is I, I want to be experiencing more variety of games than maybe get locked down in one overcoming some mega challenge. We have a lot of games to get through, right? Uh, so we're playing on normal mode. With that combo, you can beat every single mission with Space Marines and uh, a couple of backup units if you want. Uh, but basically, Space Marines are just versatile all-rounders. You equip them with a couple of bolt rifles, so they're more effective against infantry units, and equip them with a couple of rocket launchers, so they're great against vehicles and, and giant enemies, which are basically considered vehicles. And you're fine. Like, four or five squads of those will decimate pretty much everything. Uh, I never in my entire playthrough died. Like, so the mission had to restart. I had none of that. Um, and any new units that came into the game usually had some sort of quirk, which I'm kind of thinking was more multiplayer focused uh, than campaign focused. Like the Terminators that can drop into anything. They're very cool. They're very slow because they're designed to drop into the map at very specific moments. And ultimately, if you're just cleansing the map, it doesn't really matter. Um, some missions even try to kind of force you in that direction uh, by like, hey, this is kind of impassable. You should drop Terminators on the other side of the map. But they also provide you a way of just walking your units there. So, <laughs> spider the by, it's not really a big deal. Uh, the base building. So, about the base building. I loved, because I had a nostalgia hit, that I got to build bases again. However, their base building system is antiquated and old now, and certainly Command & Conquer did it better. Uh, and it was a more interesting strategic approach there uh, in order to do it. And ultimately, as you can beat everything with Space Marines, and I very much enjoyed the Space Marines. Like I don't want to say, like, oh, I've got your Space Marines again. That wasn't the case. I loved building my Space Marine squads, having them on five or six different key bindings and just positioning. Once I got used to the micro of the game, which is, you know, the micro management of the units, was totally fine with that. What I generally did is add one set of Space Marines that included a hero unit, another set that included another one, because you generally got two hero units, and then I had, like, a main bulk squad, which might be two or three or Space Marine units or, or uh, Space Marine squads, or two of those and, like, a Predator tank, something like that that provided armor and robustness. And then I added in uh, Tommy and Bobby, which were our Dreadnought and our Hellfire Dreadnought. And I'm glad to say that they only died, I think, twice through the entire campaign. Like, I kept Tommy and Bobby alive for a really, really long time and just had them up front, just like, ready for war, coming back for war. I Their actual usefulness to the mission in terms of their practical application didn't matter to me. <laughs> I just liked the Because I never built more than one of each. I just had Tommy and Bobby uh, rocking around just along for the journey more than anything because I liked them as characters in my in my story of my playthrough. Tommy and Bobby. And I said this towards the end because people are like, why aren't you using these units? Why aren't you using those? It's like, one, I'm not a big fan of them. Uh, certainly the rocket pack units. Yeah, I'm sure they have uh, kind of like, uh, I think they were called Reapers in StarCraft 2 and StarCraft. Um, they're great for like traversing difficult terrain, getting to locations very quickly, and being like this infiltration squad. 
Uh, but in my playthrough, I just had this, like, bulk army that just kind of rolled around like a snake, just taking everything out. So they didn't really fit into my what I enjoyed. Uh, so that's that's really why. I didn't like the artillery tanks. They're phenomenal at what they do, but they're wildly inaccurate. Very similar to Command & Conquer artillery uh, that the Nod had. Uh, is that if they can outrange everything, but they're wildly inaccurate. But when they hit, they do tons and tons of damage. I just preferred the Space Marines going out and doing things. Um, so that's generally what I did with the units. The base building was definitely not an afterthought, at least in the campaign. Of providing tons of upgrades and tons of units. But base building itself not really the forefront and i am aware that dawn of war 2 i think has removed the base building some people did let that slip i'm not actually that surprised uh that that would drift away from this franchise i don't think it was the strongest point but i could be wrong in multiplayer it might be a very big deal my general default was to take over list listing posts uh, or points of strategic strategic points to gain money because that's how you harvest money in this game put a couple of turrets down uh, and I never really had more than two or three servitors. And I had like one one servitor hero who would come with the army to take over at places. But in terms of the base building and unit construction, that's how I like to play. The main thing that drew me in was the story. I loved how they told this story. And there was only one thing I wished they didn't do. And the story is that a demon, a massive demon, was uh, sealed away on Tartarus inside this stone. And it's a chaos demon. And chaos wants to release this demon. And they're manipulating uh, the librarian in particular, who they are whispering in the ears. I talked about it in the last video. I loved how the librarian was not falling to chaos, but constantly being whispered to and harassed. And the, the, the way they wrote that dialogue was so good is that sometimes they're, make, they're telling you what to do, which is the true thing you should do, and sometimes not. And because you do have to do that, is that because Chaos told you to or not? And you could see how it would mess with your mind. I thought that was written really, really well. Uh, Angelos was a phenomenal captain all the way till the end. Just an ultimate badass. Like, the, his dialogue is phenomenal, and the way he works is so, so good. And the Inquisitor Toth, I believe he was called. Inquisitor Toth, who sees heresy everywhere. A common theme in the, at least a couple of Warhammer games played so far is that the Inquisitors just see heresy everywhere, and everybody's susceptible. But there's a reason for it, is that uh, there's a backstory that's established. I love the character development of Angelos. Is I believe it was called Silene. He had to call Exterminatus down on a planet where his wife and kids were. Chaos had infiltrated it. So this is somebody who's truly, truly 100% loyal to the Emperor. Who was like, this planet, even though it's my home planet where he came from and his family's there, he has been inf infected with chaos. And he had Exterminatus the planet and killed his whole family. And this is apparently the mission before they arrive on Tartarus. And the Inquisitor, rightfully, is like... You've had to do all this stuff because of chaos, and chaos will leave an impression on you. So yes, I'm wary of you. And he doesn't, he's so laser focused on the fact that Angelos is probably being manipulated by chaos that he doesn't notice the librarian is the one who's being manipulated by chaos. What I really hope to have happen here, and it didn't, is that the librarian who kind of uh, makes a point is like, I will get the key, the chaos key, and I will use it to destroy you. And then at some point he goes along with chaos uh, like in the second to last mission and i was like i really hope he's he's like playing into chaos's whims and at the end the librarian's like but i stand for the emperor and like actually helps destroy chaos unfortunately not the case he does fall to chaos and you have to kill him uh and it brings toth and angelos together uh, to form this friendship which was really cool i loved that um and then uh you um you see a wonderful cutscene where the librarian is uh, like holding the power of chaos in his hands and uh, sindri who is like the big manipulator behind the scenes uh is like and lord bale thought there's this really like luscious voice to it and i, I probably can't repeat it is lord bale thought i was weak too but now you will see that i sindri I'm in charge of all. It's got that like raspy. Blah, blah, blah. It's very snake like. Uh, it's a very snaky like voice that's going on as Sindri uh, takes the power and quells the librarian into the floor. He's like, You are nothing. I am in charge. So it's, it's addictive to do that kind of voice. 
And uh, it's uh, it's great because, you know, Chaos betrays. Chaos betrays and manipulates. And Sindri betrays everybody, including his commander, Lord Bale, who he just leaves to the wolves because he demands a larger sacrifice in order to unleash what's going on. And the story is ultimately is you're playing directly into Chaos's hands, which is great because we do after the final mission, which was surprisingly easy. Um, you end up in a mission. I think I kind of screwed this up as well is the Eldar earlier in the story are uh, pushed back and defeated by you. And the Eldar leader is like, we're trying to prevent something horrible, but the Eldar don't tell the truth. And obviously as, as Imperium, you don't trust the Xenos anyway. Um, and they're like, well, there's something way worse here. Stop. You, you, we, our forces, and the, the Eldar are quite logical about it. It's like, our forces are too weak now to cope with it. So you need to go and do it. And in the final mission... The Eldar are on the map as friendlies. And I was torn with my love of the Emperor as all Xenos aren't be trusted. And after playing a lot of RTSs in the past, I was very concerned that at some point the Eldar will just turn against us. So I left them to it. And they were pushing out very quickly into the map in the north while I had the south and was moving a bit slower because I'm not an AI. And part of me was like, should I go and defend them? Uh, because I noticed they were losing territory. I noticed that they were falling back. And I was like, should I defend them? Should I not? That's that's heresy. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's heresy. But I did see they were getting pushed back. And I was like, they haven't got much left. So I was like, I will send a squad up there to protect them so they can rebuild. Because they are helping me defeat Chaos. Um, by the time I got there, because they are on the other side of the map, all they had left was a couple of their versions of servitors, which are the constructors. Uh, and uh, a warp gate and something else and they had no form of getting money so i defended nothing they, they stood they were out of resources they couldn't do anything so by the time i got there they were left behind i'd be curious to replay this mission and defend the eldar so that they can sort of help you because the whole mission is a boss fight i will say i don't think they did the boss fights very very well here they're cool units to see, especially because it reminded me of like Final Fantasy XV with the Freet and things like that. These giant monstrous avatars of death and avatars of Khan. Um, but they're just classed as vehicle units. And they're not particularly strong in terms of eradicating your units. So I think Tommy tanked most of it. And then one of my Predator tanks tanked the other bit. And my guys just shot it and it died. Uh, this happened a couple of times throughout the missions where they had avatars and big bosses that roamed the map. I can't remember the mission uh, w that it was that there's like an avatar of Khorne is roaming the map. And you see it very early, like in the first, I don't know, five minutes of the map. And I started battering it and it went down to red health and then started to run away. And I couldn't chase it because I would have stretched myself too thin. Um, and I was like, oh, so it probably like goes and heals up, comes back later, maybe stronger, something like that. But no, when I uncovered the map a bit more, it was AFK next to a small squad of um, units. So I was like, I've also reinforced myself. I could just push out and try and kill this thing. So I did. And the, the objective is to kill the avatar and it just finished in the first five minutes. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so it's not coming back then or respawning or they're turning someone else into an avatar. Nope. That was it. That was like the boss unit. So the boss units are more for storytelling reasons than like something you should be fearful of, uh, which is fine. There is, it, 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 it's very countered by the great moments of where your tanks and units roll into churches and temples, right? You can really feel like you're crushing into these holy grounds. Uh, because you don't care for them. Like, these is, this is Xeno scum. Uh, this is Chaos Temples. I don't give a toss about these. I'm just rolling a tank right through the pews, baby. Because uh, we're space marines. And we're here to cleanse and purge the heretics uh, in holy fire. So that stuff I really, really loved. Uh, the ultimate story reveal at the end of it uh, was really cool. And I, 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 I do know from when we finish the game is that this will resolve in Dawn of War 2 and not in the expansion content. I don't think, but we'll be coming back to it anyway. So don't worry about spoiling me or anything. Um, is that all the blood we have shed, and it was very chaos. It was very Warhammer. And I love this. The final cutscene is the demon is free. And the demon is free because we have shed so much blood on this planet. We have murdered and culled and killed and butchered and massacred so hard throughout this campaign that we have pleased Khorne. 
we have pleased God Khan, and this is what has released the demon. The demon's laughing like, you did exactly. It's got a horrible voice, though. This uh, filter they used on the voice was terrible. Uh, but it's like, you have done exactly what we wished. Now I am free. Now I will conquer all, and I will start with you, Angelos. Like this, right? And you're like, oh, crap, we've released the demon. It's like, good job, Space Marines. You played exactly into Chaos's hands. And then Angelos goes... And I will be waiting. And it's like, oh, yeah, he's not afraid. He's got the, he's protected by the Emperor. The Emperor sh smiles at Angelos. And he's like, sh screw you, demon. Whenever you're ready, I'm right here. And I'm going to stomp you into the ground like I have done every other Chaos Agent on this planet. Because I live for one reason. That is to route out heresy and chaos and put an end to it. And it was great. It was great. What a great, great way of just not, not like fearful of what's coming, the oncoming storm, not afraid, nothing. No, he just stands there and says, oh yeah, bring it because I am a blood raven and I will destroy you, Chaos. I was like, this is great. This is wonderful. This is so badass. It reminds me of Doom Guy. When one of the uh, protagonists, in, I think it's in 2016, is trying to give a speech and Doomguy just punches the screen. <laughs> like, I don't care what you have to say. I'm going to murder you. I don't care how threatening you're being. I don't care how hardcore you think you are. I am I'm Doomguy and I am Angelos and I have the Emperor on my side and I will wring your neck the second I get a chance, which is exactly the follow-up to how Captain Titus is. So yes, the, there's a wonderful theme of just how badass and how awesome Space Marines are in both the Space Marine game and in Dawn of War. So needless to say, yeah, I had a great time with this. Uh, really good. I did manage to, uh, One thing I did want to point out, I put this in the S tier of games. Uh, it still holds up today. Again, just missing a couple of quality of life features that, we'd ex that we have in modern-day RTS. But it's definitely still workable. It was glad to see how many people who had never seen me before or aware of me come in and like, dude, I love this game. I can't believe you've never played it. I play it once a year. You know, real fans of the game absolutely adored that aspect of this playthrough. Um, and I, I just, I, I truly, it, probably because I'm older and it does play into my nostalgia a little bit, but I, I can't see how you wouldn't enjoy this unless you were like, it needs 4K textures to be great. Uh, or I'm just like, I need my modern day quality of life features in order to enjoy myself. I can understand that as well, especially if you grew up, if you're younger and you grew up with like basic AI, AI pathing being, you know, much, much better than it is here. I totally get that. But there's something so valuable. And I'd say this to our younger audience. There's something so valuable about going back just 10 or 20 years in video games, be it the case of turn-based RPGs of the classic Final Fantasies and Chrono Trigger and things like that. And to the old shooters, so your Space Marines and your Half-Life games. There's a lot of my friends who have never played Half-Life because it looks so old compared to what's out today. It does, but these are the games that change the genre for the better. And you go back like I did with Space Marine and go, oh, wow, this is basically what Doom 2016 came from. Like the inspiration is all here for a lot of the features that we loved in 2016. And the same with this RTS mode is like Warcraft 3. Obviously very similar to Warcraft 3, but into your Command and Conquers. Sure, the, I would say Command and Conquer did more for the RTS genre, but this is very good storytelling. Using And also you can picture that these are made by real nerds. Do you know what I mean? I guess that's what I'm talking about here. Is This is made by real just mega nerds because these games were made pre- gaming being really culturally acceptable to the widespread audience which is what we've seen over the last 10 years is that you know everybody plays video games now but it did when i was at school playing video games was really seen as a nerdy nerdy thing to do like you were a real geek if you weren't into sports and things like that and there was a lot of closet video gamers right and you can see that in documentaries people not talking about the fact they play mmos like keeping it away from their social circles as if it was some sort of drug habit or something because it was looked on that way of like oh god what a geek you know the geek chic certainly didn't exist and now it's far more acceptable uh and far more socially acceptable uh so these are made by small dedicated really super nerd teams and you can see it you can see it in the care and attention to detail of what they did to uh, certainly maintain and stick to the law 
in a really good way and uh, and certainly those of us who are fans of like oh the, uh, the latest resident evil tv show on netflix is probably a prime example of where these people are just dispensing with what made this genre great and what gives us a gate gate made us care about resident evil in the first place and they're like oh yeah that was written in like 1997 we could do better storytelling now no there's a reason lord of the rings which was written fucking ages and ages ago is still so popular today story writing is universally is ageless for the most part like the lovecraftian stuff is still ageless for the most part like good storytelling and there's a reason a lot of movies basically retell the basic stories that were written all those hundreds of years ago and i truly i truly believe that it's like the storytelling especially told by passionate people who had no interference by outside uh executives you need lines to go up and all that kind of stuff just made something they wanted to play right ultimately that's what i'm saying is like they just made a game that they wanted to play about an ip that they really cared about and certainly not to be boomer on this too much but certainly and you guys will experience this of games coming out under an ip you really care about i'm a star trek fan there's barely a single good star trek game that's ever been made because they generally just all conform to nonsense and the fact is dawn of war is canon to warhammer and following this, they added books and things to back up what happened on Tartarus uh, and wrote it into the lore of Warhammer. That's fantastic. It came, the game came first and then they added it in properly and fleshed it out a little bit more. Uh, and they've done the same with Space Marine. And uh, I'm now aware, of, especially from the YouTube comments and from uh, other people in my live stream, is that they have done a, a magazine article to expand on what happened to Titus between the events of, of uh, Space Marine and Space Marine 2, which is due in September. So I'm, I'm just, I'm loving this nostalgia here. And I guess my final words here is, yes, this game is phenomenal. Uh, and I would also say, if, if these games, like, visually, you look at it and go, ooh, old. I'd say, dispense with that, because I tell you something. After you play for about 10 minutes, you ignore graphics completely. And that's happened to me in near enough every video game I've ever played, is once you play it for, like, 10 minutes, you just adjust, and you're like, oh, okay, yeah, this makes sense. Uh, no different than jumping into a new MMO. Is it takes, it takes a few more hours with an MMO, but once you get comfy, you're like, oh, okay, this is fine. And every time someone drops in when I'm playing, like, Guild Wars or FF14 or whatever, and they're like, God, this game looks old. It's like, it doesn't matter. Star Wars The Old Republic, it looks great. Like, it's fine. It, it's totally workable. Everything makes sense. No, it's not 4K ray traced stuff. But I don't care because the game is good. Like, what I'm doing is so enjoyable and so fun that I'm not really bothered uh, at all. It's, I'm not going to, like, zoom in Total Biscuit style on a wall and go, this texture could be better, right? I love TB to death. But watching that stuff, I'm like, I don't really care. <laughs> I don't really care. Next up on the list, you're probably wondering if you haven't seen already. Next on the list, I kind of span the wheel on this one because Space Marine and Dawn of War were the ones that people like definitely do those as one of two. Uh, one and two. We landed. We are playing Total uh, Warhammer 40k Mechanicus. Uh, I can tell you as of recording this, I've played a couple of hours and my god, it's XCOM style. It's got Darkest Dungeon vibes to it. Needless to say, you can see the smile on my face. Yes, it's a good time. So thank you so much for listening. I hope you check this game out. And onward to the Adeptus Mechanicus. Praise the Omnissiah.